Today, I'm speaking with Jennifer Graham. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Tim. Absolutely. And just to give a quick bio for Jennifer, Jennifer was born in South Africa. I love your accent, by the way. She left in 1975 and since then has led a peripatetic life, uh, living in England, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and now back in Canada on the Pacific side. Jennifer was raised in a strict fundamentalist home. She is an author as well. She wrote a book called An Immoral Proposal. I'll have the link for that beneath this video if you want to go check it out on Amazon. It's about her time growing up in South Africa, as well as focusing on the, the story about her strict fundamentalist background, as well as her exile from South Africa. She's a member of Toastmasters International, which is really cool. She's a proud grandmother of six. She's also an admin for a Facebook group called The Mental Health Wizard. It's an online self-help mental health group. And it's run by a psychologist friend of hers who focuses on cognitive behavioral therapy. So I'll have the link for that as well, if you'd care to check that out. Besides what I know about you so far, Jennifer, tell us more about yourself. Well, I love uh, arts and crafts. I love making things. And so my hobby came out of COVID because, you know, everybody was on YouTube watching YouTube tutorials. And I came across something called junk journaling. Now, have you have you ever heard of junk journaling? So, I don't think so junk, no. yeah, so junk journaling is really basically using th papers or uh, cardboard from cereal boxes, anything paper that you would discard that you would put in the recycling bin, and turning them into beautiful journals, all kinds of journals. If you key in junk journals on YouTube, you will see it's quite a big thing. Hmm. So that's that's my that's my thing. I, that's very I cool. love, I've never heard of that. Yeah. But also as an extension of that, I also make needle books. I have one here if I can just sure. if I could just grab one here. So uh, so I also make these needle books. And in this way, you can see that I'm using oops. I'm using my artistic um, skills in in this. Uh, it's sort of it's mixed media, really. Yeah. In this, uh, yeah. So this is my hobby. So this is just one facet of junk journaling. Very cool. So Very cool. so that's my that's my jam. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm sure your grandkids love to see that stuff too. It's it's uh, fun for the, the kids yeah. to be. And able I'm, to... I'm I make them as gifts as well for people. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Well, mm -hmm. again, I'm so glad you're here. We, we love to uh, hear people's stories, of course. That's what we're all about. So uh, if you could uh, tell us about how you got exposed to Christianity, and especially I'm looking forward to hearing about the the nuances of, of what it's like in South Africa. I've mm -hmm. done a few interviews that have, uh, you know, people from that area, uh, but uh, and it's, it seems like there's some definite differences from what I'm used to. So I'm looking forward to hearing your story. So take us away. Yeah. So, yeah, so I grew up in an era where... Europeans came to colonize and Christianize the the colonies or the heathens taking the the gospel to all four corners of the world, so to speak. And so, the main religion in South Africa was uh, Protestantism. They also they were Catholics, but the Catholics, but Protestant the Protestants uh, were dominant. I grew up in a country, you know, at, at the time, the Western countries prided themselves on being a Christian country, a Christian nation. And so South Africa was a Christian nation. It had a, a the national religion was the Dutch Reformed Church. That was the, the national religion. So it was very strict. I think as was the West, the rest in the Western world, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 50s and 60s mainly, uh, the Lord's Day was observed. And so, uh, yeah, so labor ceased and church bells rang everywhere to call the faithful, to call the flock to, to come worship. I hate that word, flock. Did you ever see that movie Chariots of Fire on that note? Yeah. That was yes. a big deal on that movie. That's you can, right. Like, you cannot run on the Sabbath. Run on the Lord's day. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So the government of the day, uh, I grew under the up under the apartheid government. It was the, a nationalist government. They came into power in 1948, 
So apartheid was well entrenched by the time I was born in 1956. Uh, the apartheid regime was fascist and authoritarian and really oppressive. While the rest of the world tried to eradicate racism, uh, the nationalist government actually legislated systematic racism. The government leaders were fascist, but were also very religious. Mm. And the religion was uh, based, the government religion interpreted the Bible to mean that white people were the superior superior race and non-white people were descendants of Ham, Noah's son, mm. the cursed, the cursed uh, yeah. race. So that's where they were coming from. So I was raised under oppressive government, under oppressive religion, and in a press oppressive a very strict household where that God's word was the final authority and you never question God, God's word. Actually, yeah. in the fascist government, of course, you not you not allowed to question the government and not question religion. So yes, yeah, so that is so I was fully indoctrinated right. uh, and raised not to question, not to think. Can I ask, with, of it. Yep. with it being so strict, someone uh, like myself, where it's it's I've never been in, in anything that I would describe remotely like that directly uh, in terms of like a governmental level. Did most people who grew up in it from your experience where they were indoctrinated from the earliest days, did they seem to look at it as if it was like, this is just this is a good way to live. This is fine. This is normal. Or was it like, wow, we hate this. Like, you know, how do we change this, even though we technically shouldn't even say that? You know, but like, can we change this because this is so oppressive? Like, what what level what level of uh, acceptability were were people coming up with? You know, in their response, I think most people, the majority of people, accepted that because you must remember that we were raised from the time that we could walk. From we were, and the indoctrination was not only in in the household. It was in the church and it was in schools because we typically had to start with the Lord's Prayer, uh, start the lessons, start the day with the Lord's Prayer. And also uh, the curriculum had a lot of uh, Christian content in it. Like for recitation, we had to recite uh, Psalm 23, Psalm 121, um, mm. together together with some other uh, other poetry and and so forth. But you know, you know, the Bible was very entrenched in the curriculum. Could I ask what were you allowed to like go to the playground and play with people of other races? Like, how strict were were those kind of rules? Oh no, no, the the. Under apartheid, the races were segregated so mm. that uh, the whites had their own school, the mixed race people, which are, were la are labeled colored, had their, of which I am uh, from that race, uh, they had their own, own schools, and then the blacks, which are the tribal blacks, like the Corsas and the Zulus and so forth, and all the other tribes. There are, oh gosh, over 60 tribes in South Africa. They had their own schools, their own school system, and the, the uh, system or the level of education was uh, segregated segregated was the word I want was um, tiered uh, so that the whites got the best education they got Shakespeare <laughs> uh, the colors got the second best and the blacks got the got the just the basic education because mm. government didn't really you know with a fascist government they and an authoritarian government they they reluctant to educate people because education means freedom 
So everybody grow, grows up in that system where all your friends and loved ones are all going to look pretty much like you and all doing the same exact yeah. thing. That's, yeah. that's amazing. I, it's hard to even wrap my yeah. mind around the, I know, the perspective a, that it would take to get into that. Yeah, it was a really, like, really very, uh, very complex, weird, horrible system. So when you, you, you mentioned the Dutch Reformed Church and just the whole, you know, exposure there with the church being involved in a lot of this, what what were the some of the messages you heard at church? Like, what do you remember them teaching about? Oh, yeah, that you are all sinners and uh, uh, <laughs> you were sinners and that you better toe the line or God will punish you. One always heard that. In the playground too. Don't lie. God, God's going to punish you. <laughs> so, uh, so that was, uh, uh, yeah, that you were that you were you were sinners, and then for us, the oppressed people, we, uh, our reward was in heaven, uh, but still we had to that we had to adhere. By the Bible's edict that we were to obey authority, we had to obey those in authority over us. That was the, yeah. Mm. The Did you have, mindset. when you looked at the message of, you know, you said toe the line, was there woven into that the idea that God is is a loving savior or did that, did that ever come into the equation for you, if not in childhood? Like, what was the message of having a closeness with God? It was kind of a, a mixed message because, you know, in Sunday school, we uh, learned Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But then uh, God was also, don't piss God off because he's going to pun he's going to punish you. And, and, you know, going to hell and that sort of thing, burning in hell. Yeah. And, and also... It was very, the rules were very strict in that what we wore, what we, uh, the kind of entertainment that we had, we, you know, no, go, no dancing, no going to the movies. Uh, no, women were not allowed to cut their hair. That was a sin. Why? One said, oh, because the Bible says every hair on your head is numbered. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the reason that, that women shouldn't cut their hair. Wow. And uh, what was the other thing? No, car uh, oh, no, no cards? No, no okay. cards, no, drink no drinking, alcohol, no smoking. Oh, my gosh, those were the worst sins. Uh, drinking and smoking, uh, uh, drinking alcohol and smoking those were the worst sins they were kind of uh in in tears you know like the dancing well drinking and smoking those were the biggies and then dancing also yeah not very good um can i ask uh, just for context what how many kids were there in your family six children at the time Okay, so you're uh, one of that six. I that I you're one of six, yes. But then, after I left South Africa, I left when I was nineteen. Uh, then my mother got pregnant and had twins. Wow! So there's eight eight in the family altogether. My mother had eight children. Yeah, gotcha. and yes, and that <laughs> and the funny thing is when I when I talked to her a few years ago and I asked her a little bit about her growing up and so forth and I, I, I said did you always want a big family and she said no uh, because uh, at that time you know there was no birth control and also coming from growing up in a religious setting you went by the quiverful you know that God opened your womb and closes your womb when he doesn't want you to have any more children and so that was the mindset that she grew up with yeah and when you mix that with stuff like don't deprive your husband you oh. know which it says too then you know yeah. don't deprive your husband and by the way if you get babies it's a blessing from god yeah Quirif yeah Quirifal is almost an assumption at that point exactly exactly yeah so yes i i was 
indoctrinated uh, from the time that I was very young um, through school. Yeah, you just couldn't get away from religion. Religion was so entrenched in the fabric of society. Everybody was religious. We in Cape Town, so I grew up in Cape Town. And Cape Town uh, was kind of more cosmopolitan. It was a kind of a melting pot. Uh, so it had lots of different religions. Uh, there was the Muslim, people of Jewish faith, mainly uh, Protestant, Dutch reform. They were very conservative and uh, they were steeped in Calvinism. And then there were the... Anglican Christians influenced by um, English missionaries. So we had a melting pot of culture as well as religion, and we all got got along very well. When, uh, well, on well in quotes. <laughs> huh? Well in Sorry? quotes, as in like, you got along well as long as you all towed the line and kept all the legalism. It's It sounds oh, like yeah. a very interesting... Um, tightrope wire of you know, walking on eggshells but as long as everyone walks on eggshells the right way we're all just fine <laughs> it's, it's exactly yeah that's a good way to put it yeah so yeah so i grew up in my household i grew up in uh, pentecostalism and the word that i really detest to this day is the word obedience because you know obey obey the government obey god's word obey Obey your parents, and if you did not obey, uh, you were severely punished. Uh, so, yeah, that's how I grew up. We just simply had blind faith. I mean, everybody just, everybody was, oh, to be a, a Christian was a good thing. If you made a job application, uh, it, it actually asked for your religion. Hmm. And, and if you were, Christian, then you know that was a a shoe in. A plus. It was, yeah, that it's was interesting how that yeah. often works too in reverse, where like if you're virtuous, people assume you're a Christian. Even yeah. today, like um, you know, I I do this, and I've heard of the people have this experience too, where people that are around you will see you like helping. I'm just going to use it, an extreme example, but help a little old lady across the street. You know, uh, help her put her groceries in her car or something. You do something to help those in need and people like assume, oh, you're virtuous. So you must, you must be a Christian. And it's yes. funny how it works. If you're a Christian, you're virtuous, if you're virtuous, you're Christian. Uh, they yes. obviously do not, they're not mutually exclusive, but it's just funny how the, the world sees it that way often. And and if you're an atheist, you are horrible. You're the yeah. devil. You There's no good in you. No good can come from you. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's how I uh, raised in the Pentecostal. Uh, church, going to church uh, morning, noon, and night. And uh, I was, so my parents were saved when I was a small child. But before that, I think when I was a baby, I were, they were, they belonged to the Anglican church, the local uh, Anglican church. But Anglicans and Catholics, according to fundamentalists, are not true Christians. They're not real Christians because they they not accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they haven't. Even, and they do baptism all wrong. They do baptism by sprinkling, and they also uh, they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Uh, which used to freak me out as a child, the Holy Ghost, you know, it was, I, I, it was very confusing to me, ghosts. And yeah. It was very <laughs> spooky, very spooky. And then when, whenever they, whenever they, whenever they had Holy Ghost infilling meetings, that too was a really weird, bizarre, spooky event. And, you know, everybody, everybody's um, bleeding and crying and wailing and then, you know, uh, speaking in tongues. Like yeah. just a, a great big massive like madhouse, really. And so, they, would, they would say all that activity was directly because the Holy Ghost was, was coming into them at that point? 
Yes, and they said, they also said, well, you know, this is normal. This is the normal way that the Holy Spirit should be received because in the early church, that is how it was received. The people ran in the streets and they thought that they were drunk and, and that. So mm. we, but we thought that we were doing the real thing. We were experiencing the real thing like the early church did. Do you recall seeing your parents like speaking in tongues or doing something ecstatic? My, I never saw my mother speaking in tongues. Uh, I don't know if she, if she, if she even faked it. <laughs> so she, so she wasn't sort of heavily into tongues. My father yeah, spoke sort of a little bit, but uh, I think that the speaking in tongues wasn't um, his his big thing. But I mean, yeah, he still believed that you had to be filled with the spirit and speak in tongues. But we had people who would have a gift. Uh, and then they would have these Holy Ghost meetings, and then, uh, then they would, they would come, and then they would sort of coach you how to speak in tongues, and sort of come, sort of, uh, like, come on, come on, you can do it, come on. That's amazing. <laughs> and you come up with shoot about on. <laughs> That's so crazy. Um, I was just curious, the the segregation you mentioned a few minutes ago was that prevalent as well in your church? So even in church, you would have seen only oh, yeah. people just like you. Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, and of course to the crazy. to the white, I think to the white people, they presented a white God, a white God and a white Jesus. Of course, you know Jesus with the with the lamb and the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Yeah. Do you think that infiltrated the way that people of the other skin colors in their churches saw Jesus too? Like, did they see him as a white Jesus? Yes, uh, uh, at first, yes, but then I think. Now, the thing is, you know, because we were segregated, we didn't really kn uh, know what went on on the other side of the fence. And we didn't really understand somebody else's culture. So we sort of made a lot of assumptions. But I think that the black people did sort of create their own God in their, you know, I think they saw God in a different way. As a child, of course, you know, God was white because from all the from all the uh, art images that one saw. Yeah, uh, God was European, and so that was the God and Jesus were European. So that that's what they that's the God that they presented to us. It's amazing when you look back at the verses, like in Genesis, where God says, uh, "Let us make man kind in our image." Yeah. And you realize it's what's actually going on in this whole religious thing is that we are making a God in our image. Absolutely. And it's, just, it's all reverse. Absolutely. And, you know, my whole deconversion was when I came to that conclusion that it was the reverse. Hmm. That, oh, I, I don't want to get jump yeah. ahead then. I don't want to steal your thunder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, uh yeah, so that was the Pentecostal church. And of course, oh, God, the uh, choruses, the singing of the choruses and the happy clappy. And the, in our church, we didn't have uh, the, a piano. The church was the poor to afford piano. So they had guitar and accordion and, uh, yes, the spirit and hand clapping and the choruses ad nauseum. Uh, lots of praise the Lord, hallelujah, hallelujahs. And oh, those choruses still are pesky earworms to this day because, you know, <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I'd hear a word and then ah, it'll trigger a chorus. And then, mm. uh, yeah, I have the same thing. It's crazy how deep it, it goes. Yeah. It's, it's kind yeah. of like you, you're, you think you've done so much healing and pulled up so many roots of this stuff and it's still there. I know, yes, and I, geez, I, I think, ah, oh, I, I, I regret that I, that my brain is filled with all this, the this nonsense, all this sort of indoctrinating nonsense, and not, and I wish that my, that I could have filled, filled my brain with literature or Shakespeare, 
standing on them and the Bible. Yeah. Did and, you, with, with your, all these kids in, this, in the family and so forth and your parents taking you, was there a strong, urgent message of you need to get right with God for the afterlife? Like you need to get out of hell. So, you know, trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior? No, not in our house, but at church, certainly. Uh, you know, my parents never sat us down or say, oh, you know. Uh, at home, the Christian faith was enforced in behavior, in doing the right thing, in looking the right way, uh, in not swearing and not going to a cinema and not <laughs> everything was a sin. Oh, my gosh. Everything was a sin. It's a sin. Mm. You sinning. <laughs> so is it, it sounds a little bit workspace. Would you say that they preached a message of if you just believed that Jesus died for your sins, you're going to heaven? Or was it like you still got to be really, really, really good and, and avoid sins to oh. get to heaven? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sort of a double, uh, double message, you know, a mix, mixed message. Uh, they would gotcha. say, oh, it's not by it's not by works. It's by faith. But then you still had to toe the line, as I said, in terms of your behavior, in terms of hmm. your speech and everything, no swearing. And... Did you feel like you could rest in your salvation at all, or just rest in your relationship no. with the Lord? No, no, hmm. no. And I'll touch on that later. That, you know, yeah, sounds can, good. You, yeah, can never be good enough. So, uh, you know, back to the 1950s, uh, the 1950s, so we didn't have television. Uh, so we, but we did listen to the radio, shortwave radio, particularly. We got Oral Roberts on shortwave radio, and that was a big thing. Uh, and it was very scratchy, and and you had the, you know, the, the sort of noise of the, the wavelengths and so forth. So, yes, uh, we used to listen to Oral Roberts. I think it was on a Friday evening. Everybody sits around this little transistor radio listening to Oral Roberts. And then, of course, there would be the the healing, uh, the healing thing, you know, touching the radio to be healed. And I got my first healing, Tim. Really? <laughs> I, yes. <laughs> Tell us what happened. I, I had a wart. <laughs> I had a wart. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if it was under my finger or my knee. I forget where the wart was. So I would have been about five or so. And uh, my grandma said, oh, yeah, put your hand on the radio. <laughs> so I put my hand on the radio. And uh, the next week, the wart was gone. It, uh, you know, it didn't just, it didn't go instantly. It took about a week for the miracle to happen. <laughs> so, That's so amazing. That's about, that was my heat, my first healing. So yeah, so we were influenced by the likes of Oral Roberts first in the 1950s and 60s, and and of course Billy Graham as well on shortwave radio, and then later Jimmy Swaggart, oh, no. Jimmy Swaggart, and oh no, <laughs> Jimmy Swaggart, and uh, oh gosh, yeah, every then subsequent when television finally came and tell television so i didn't grow up with television and television only uh came to south africa in 1976 and i left in 1975 so i didn't grow up with television at all so since the advent of television they then got all the tele the tele evangelists that uh, dominate north america but today of course they have their own tele evangelists and their own mega churches and their own pastors who have uh, mega celebrity pastors who have styled themselves after the modern tele tele evangelist. America has definitely led the way in that stuff, from what I know. Yeah. Our history yes. is amazing. What we've done, and all in oh. the name of name of the Lord, but it's it's more oh. like colonialism and, and and all that stuff. It's oh, very absolutely. Sad. Absolutely, but America was also at that time, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, especially after the Second World War, America was, uh, of course, very prosperous and booming and led the way in everything and became a, a superpower. So everybody looked to America. And for us, I mean, we just worshipped anything that came out of America. So we 
we, you know, guy, we, we worship these guys like Oral Roberts and all these these guys. They were up there next to God. Oral, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, they were up there next to God. Mm. So, so yeah, I remember I was it, uh, I got to be at a Billy Graham crusade once where I was actually like a one of the hundreds or whatever thousands of counselors that go down to you know to, to find someone that supposedly is ready to give their life to the Lord and. You you know you say the prayer with them and read them through a book uh, and help. You were them get... you were a counselor. You were yeah, I was one of the counselors. I I led yeah. a, a couple. I believe yeah. a husband and wife. Uh, but yeah. you know, but just that I, I definitely could relate to that sense of when you're finally like all going down to the to the to the field and yeah, on mass on yeah. mass. But you're like you're getting close to Billy Graham himself. It just feels mm. like like there's this aura about him, and it's it's mm. it, it is it's it's very very palpable when you're in it. Yes, yeah, the the power of cult and yeah, personality mass, cult. yeah, personality cult and mass uh, indoctrination, yeah, and then yeah, we had tent meetings, and and we had then some of the minor uh, evangelists, the minor American evangelists, the ones that that probably weren't as big. Oh gosh, let me see who uh, we had. Oh, and from the Oral Roberts U uh, University in the 1970s, then we had a, a group called the Living Sound, and their evangelist, uh, Terry Law, and they were all from Oral Roberts University, and they came as a as a team. And, and they, by this time, this was in the early 70s, late 60s early 70s they were really hip they you wore they had the bell bottoms and they had the the hair and they had the makeup and they looked they looked like hollywood stars you know to us and we just, and they came and they uh they brought new kind of music you know with drums and all that and so that caused a ruckus <laughs> in the church no, no. Uh, bringing drums in the church it was very ungodly <laughs> mm. so uh yeah so that yeah the living sound and um uh, and and some of the other uh as i say you know minor uh evangelists and so and my father by by this time had gone into the ministry. So my, my father grew up in the mm -hmm. Assemblies of God. Uh, you know, he didn't grow up in the Assemblies of God Church, but after he was saved, he joined the Assemblies of God Church and then and then worked his way up in his growth to elder. And then after he was an elder, uh, there was some falling out in the church. And then after that, he felt that God had call, called him to become a preacher to go win souls in the sort of down and out uh, areas. So he wasn't like a regular Canada. pastor of a church, but more like a missionary pastor? Well, I guess he started as a missionary pastor and then gathered some flock and then became, and then built this church. I see. Uh, so he's into church, church, uh, what's it called? Church building? Is it church, church building planting. ministry? Church planting, yeah. church planting ministry. So he planted this church in this uh, really down and out uh, area, low so so socioeconomic area, and uh, brought the message of hope and the message of gospel to the people, and then grew a church of oh probably about three hundred and fifty people, yeah, mm -hmm. under the auspices of the Assemblies of God. When your dad became a pastor like that, did you feel that the pressure on your mom and on the kids increased at all to be very, like, really upstanding? Like, look, you're, oh. if you, you know, disobey your dad or you and one of you ends up getting caught smoking or pregnant in a wedlock, like your your dad could lose his ministry over this. So, you know, you know, tighten uh, up here. No, 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 not so much lose the ministry because now, because he was now the head pastor. He was the lead pastor. Okay. And he, you know, that was his patch, as it were. But yes, it was. Uh, it was the onus was on us to set the example. And I remember one time I was kind of pushing my luck there a little bit. And I had bought myself a pair of jeans, and uh, so I because we could in the summertime we could wear shorts 
but not long pants. We don't get that. We could wear shorts, but not long pants. So I sort of kind of pushed the envelope and I uh, wore, uh, I got myself on jeans. And then uh, my mother chastised me and said, go and take that off. You know, we are supposed to be examples, you know, to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, go take off the jeans. And same with makeup. You know, we had lots of fights about mm. makeup and uh, and jeans, and you know, I just wanted to be hip with the rest of the, the rest of my peer group. So, yeah. The big message I always and, heard yeah. was that you just, you had to really be wary of wearing what the opposite gender might wear, because those verses that say "Don't wear a woman's clothing" and you know, women don't wear men's clothing, oh, and so it was always yeah. like, and I, I always question, like, well, the Scottish right have kilts, like they wear kilts, and those were, a, you know, like a skirt. Like, yeah. are they in? Are they in trouble with God over that? And it always bothered me. Yeah. But yeah, maybe I, I wonder if the shorts thing was like shorts were feminine enough to be feminine, but pants were like maybe that was like a man's garment back then. Like only men wore pants, so maybe it felt like it was breaking that rule. Yeah, but yet back in the day, in the in Bible times, even with uh, pants, men didn't wear pants. They wore everybody wore robes, right? Totally nonsensical. Yeah. So how I came to faith. I I went forward, you know, about going forward, right? In the in the Pentecostal church is the going forward after the preaching. So I went forward. Uh, I was to about twelve years old uh, because I didn't want to go to hell. A, a message of brimstone and hellfire was preached uh, in that evening, and I remember the sermon was it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god and then the example of that was the the beautiful starlet hollywood starlet jane mansfield who had fame and fortune she possessed she had the whole world but but she lost her what was to say uh, what shall it profit a man to Gain the world and lose his soul, right? Yeah. She had the whole world at her feet, and then she was in this horrific accident. And then the pastor even made this sort of gruesome uh, exaggeration. I mean, he had read this in the newspaper, of course, that Jane Mansfield was decap decapitated and her head rolled down in, in the road. <laughs> Adding that sort of bit of ghoulishness. Can you imagine scaring the hell out of kids that way? Mm. So, of course, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So then, yeah, that yeah, that was enough to make me go forward. I went forward. And it's like God's a ma mafia boss. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah! He's going to get you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I went. Um, I went forward. You know, and of course, at 12 years old, I mean, what do you know? Uh, you just know what you told and you know, OK, I'm not going to go to hell. I'm saved now. And then at age 16, I rededicated my life to the Lord. And this time I you know, understood a little bit more. I was a little bit more mature. And so I was very serious about my commitment uh, to to the Lord, and I got myself baptized. And at that time, uh, we didn't have a, the church didn't, wasn't wealthy enough to have a building. So we met in the, in the local uh, town hall. And uh, so we didn't have a baptistry or anything. But then once a year, we would have a baptismal service. Uh, they, you know, they were, like maybe a couple of other ch churches in the same situation as we were. And then we would go, we would have an, a day out on a, on a Sunday and, uh, and, and be baptized in the river. Uh, so that was yeah. kind of fun because it was a mass picnic with, we combined with other churches. So it was a mass picnic and we'd usually go up country and, uh, the the mothers will prepare the really good. That food was so good, you know, like cold roast chicken drumsticks and uh, 
picnic food. Uh, and so we'd have a mass picnic, but we'd have the morning service. Uh, so that was kind of different. It was fun because it was different from some sort of every Sunday humdrum. And then we'd have the picnic. And then later, like about three o'clock, we'd have the Baptist mill in the, in the river, in the open air. And, uh, and with the local people, you know, standing by the banks of the river and watching. And then we would be told, and, and it was kind of embarrassing for a 16-year-old, self-conscious, you know, you felt self-conscious. But we were told that, you know, you got to uh, acknowledge Jesus in public. You acknowledge him in public and, and, and he will acknowledge you. You know, so that was that was the thing. So I got baptized. And asked, did and you feel like when you did that, the profession, the baptism, that you were really kind of at a maybe a, a higher echelon of your spiritual yeah. life? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah, mm. uh, yes. And so, and then of course, you know, you also got the uh, affirmation from your the fellow Christians, especially from the older Christians, and oh, you know what a wonderful step this is and so yeah you know that was the one time you got affirmation so of course also the thing with the baptism was that your your old self gets buried in 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 the in the water and then your new self the new and improved me (laughs) came up was raised out of the water and so i felt yes that i had gained approval from god approval from my pastor, approval from my family, and approval from the con- congregation for taking that step. So yes, it did raise me up uh, uh, to mm. a new status. Can I ask, so, do, do you remember if any anyone like in, who grew up in a similar uh, environment with you, or maybe they went through some of the same classes and the same exposures to the different messages that the preachers were giving, for anyone that didn't, do that did the pressure probably build to say like if you're not getting baptized maybe you're not really saved which means you really might be in a you know in a bad spot here in your relationship with god like what was there a pressure or did people give you the freedom and and some like in a quasi positive sense to say like look you pursue god you know in your way in your time frame we just we're here for you we just want you to you know know the lord and love the lord as you know however you can or was it like if you don't get baptized soon you know we might might kind of crank the pressure up on you. Uh, no, uh, that wasn't pushed because you know the bap- baptism, uh, baptism, as I said, was once a year, you know, and we usually waited for summer, and that was the you know the okay. big picnic, the big thing. So closer to that, yeah, then pressure was was put on that yeah, you know, yes, we're going to have a baptism, and then they would sort of just reinforce that a bit, gotcha. yeah. So it's more of the yeah. threat of like if you don't do it now, you have to wait a whole year. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. And it, you know, it was a, it was a big event, and there was a lot of hype to, uh, with that. But it also had a sort of nice picnic um, atmosphere, and um, it was you know the one big event in the church. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. When you yeah. when you did that, did you feel like there was any level of not just that the church was admiring you or your friends were admiring you, but that you were really growing in your personal relationship with, with the Lord? Like, what was your prayer life like? Put it that way. You, you know, look, I was only 16, so it was still kind of, you know, quite scatty. And, uh, Did you feel like you could, spotty. you know, especially like when you went to bed at night, you could kind of talk to God and end the night with, you know, some kind of sense of, hey, God, I'm struggling with this, or I need your help, or I need your direction, you know, God, I, I want to be closer to you. I want to honor you, whatever, you know, did you feel like you could kind of go to him and talk to him as if you were like, yeah. yes, he's this yeah. high high and holy God, but he's also your, yeah. your father. He's your heavenly father, yeah. he's your friend. Like, was that yes. there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Although, yeah, cognitively understood that, but emotionally, uh, there wasn't a, a, that sort of connection. I mean, I still have poor self-esteem. I still didn't feel loved because, you know, family circumstances and so forth. Our household was as dysfunctional as they come. 
on the outside, we presented, uh, oh, you know, sort of pious, pious, good Christian people. But on the on the uh, inside, internally, it was chaotic and dysfunctional. And my parents, you know, they, they struggled financially. They had a big family. There were lots of arguments especially on a Sunday before church. It'd be arguments and fights and shouting and whatever, and we get to church. And then, oh, hallelujah. Uh, wow. My parents uh, parented the way that they were parented and the way that everybody parented at that time. And because, as I say, everybody was steeped in religion and the Bible, so the style of parenting was spare the rod and spoil the child. And so there was a lot of mm. uh, beatings, especially my brothers. I, I didn't really get any beatings, uh, but there, were, there was a lot of uh, abuse, mental, uh, physical, emotional abuse. And, you know, coupled mm. with that, there was... The Bible telling you that you're not good enough, that you are a stinking rotten sinner, and that you had to keep repenting, you know, every Sunday, come confess your sins and so mm. forth. Uh, also, because my parents were struggling financially, they had a kind of rocky beginning in their married life. I was given to my grandmother to raise when my mother was expecting my brother. There's 17 months between my brother and me. And so from an economical point of view, uh, they they were struggling. And so they had lived with my grandparents at that time. They lived with them for a short while uh, when my parents first got married. And then after, then I was born and then uh, when my brother was born, they just left me with my grandparents. My grandparents raised me till I was 12 years old. So I so grew up as an only child in my grandparents' house. Mm. And uh, and then my mother went. And then I had, after that, my five siblings lived with my parents. Uh, so you can imagine the confusion in in a child's life. Why? Does my mother not want me? Why am I not living with you know my parents and my siblings? Mm. So there was that sort of feelings of uh, rejection and abandonment. Uh, I mean, not that I could articulate that as a child, but you know later uh, those feelings certainly came very strongly to the fore. So. My mother, uh, my mother actually didn't like children. So. Wow. <laughs> How ironic. Yeah, I know. My mother didn't like children, and she just felt that children were a burden. Um, so she, and she, she had no maternal instincts. So I didn't feel love for my mother. My father, with my father, uh, the Lord's work came first. The Lord's work came before everything else. Mm. Something that in his later life he regretted. He he said that the, he he he's now deceased. Uh, but it was something that he regretted. So yeah, so he was just he, he did have uh he was working as a furniture uh, sales rep. Uh, you know, to put food on the table. So he was doing part-time pastoring. Uh, so, yeah, for him, the domain of the house was the, the wife's domain. The women look after the children. I mean, that was the the general uh, understanding of roles. Uh, and according yeah. to the Bible as well, you know, the woman looks after the house, the, the man uh, is the breadwinner. Yeah. Or the pastor, or, or whatever. Yeah. Hmm. So, so yeah. From that point of view, it was kind of very. My childhood was very dysfunctional and very, very mixed up. And then also, 
when I became a teenager, then there was, um, you know, molestation uh, in the church. Uh, the same brothers who raised holy hands on a Sunday, you know, on the Monday they were groping little girls when no one was looking. And so that was also very confusing for many of us. And But, of course, you know, everything was always swept under the carpet. Uh, you just you just never talked about such things. And so you had to keep, so many of us uh, kept those things to ourselves. And, and then you felt very confused and you felt unclean, you felt dirty, you felt uh, that, you must have done something wrong and 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 of course that was the attitude if you did tell an adult then they blamed the victim oh you must have done something wrong or you your skirt must have been too short or you know you mm. were the temptress that's what my, uh, my childhood and then into my teens that those were the the emotional things that I struggled with mm. it's a very rough start to not just to Christianity, but to life in general. That's that's hard. Oh yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, culturally, it was understood that men couldn't control their urges, and that it was up to the the women to guard themselves against the men and wear the right thing and and so forth. What what do they call it? The the purity culture. Yeah. Did yeah. you, despite some of the more more uh, painful parts of that part of your journey did you feel like the idea of looking forward to starting your own marriage someday and potentially family uh, your own kids oh. did that seem like a, an appealing thing either culturally or, or for sure for the lord and it's you know just the idea of raising up a godly home and a godly heritage and leaving a legacy of godly children and godly soldiers for jesus as it were behind uh did that appeal to you at that age as you were kind of exiting teenagehood Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I uh, because my life was so emotionally chaotic. I it, when I got to the to my late teens, and also it was just the natural progression uh, when you got to your late teens, early twenties, that you were now at a marriageable age because education wasn't encouraged for women uh, in particular mm. and then also uh the uh the role or the uh aspiration of becoming a a mom you know was sort of very virtuous virtuous that was the thing to strive for and mm. also the thing is i wanted uh, because of the chaos i, I must um just backtrack and say that so my grandmother raised me till I was 12 years old and so when I was uh, at, at that time you know I was just so confused and so torn as to where I belonged uh, I had this big identity crisis you know uh, I lived with my grandparents but my parents were and my siblings were there and I was here and I was sort of betwixt and between. Uh, at this time, my parents were able to afford a a house, a three bedroom house, and so I request I wanted to go live with them. I wanted to go live with my my parents, and then uh, at this point, I did go and. I did go live with my parents and my siblings, and it was a very difficult time because I was going into puberty and and having lived as an only child for twelve years now, I w had to share my life with my five siblings, and my being the oldest, I was then put in charge of them. Uh, so yeah, that was a lot mm. uh, on my shoulders. I lived with my parents for only seven my parents and their household for only seven years because then at age 19 then I left for England it, during my teenage years then I uh, that, this is when depression began to manifest itself in me and 
And of course, you know, these dark feelings then were ascribed to the devil and you know, just as rebuke the devil and just keep praising God and praising God and draw near to God and sort of get more into the Bible. Mm. Uh, at this time, I was also, uh, it, my, my girlfriends were going steady. They started to date and some of them were, getting married at age 18, 19, 20. And so at this time, I felt that I need, I I asked God, could she send me a nice young man? Because, you know, I, I had sort of had casual boyfriends here and there, but, you know, just as so it was a sort of teenage thing. Uh, had casual boyfriends here and there, but, you know, nothing really serious. And it was sort of more experimental, you know, the kissing and necking and so forth and so on. Um, at this at this point, yes, yeah, so I prayed and I said, oh, God, can you send me a nice young man? And I said, God, you said that if, uh, what is that what, the scripture that says, and he will grant you the desires of your heart? Yeah, Trust in the Lord. To let yourself in the, the Lord. In the Lord, yeah, and he will give you uh, desires of your heart. So that's what I prayed. And uh, the, the prayer was was answered in uh, a <laughs> sort of really unexpected way. I had started, I left school when I was 17. The school, at that time, the school, the high school had a two-tiered system. You could leave school at 16, at the end of your 16th year, you know, before you turn 17, you can leave at 16 with a junior certificate or you could carry on for two more years and then leave school with a senior certificate. A senior certificate would open more doors for you and uh, prepare the way for if you wanted to go on to university. So oh. I left at a school which I hated my high school with a passion uh, it was <laughs> sort of more like a concentration camp because you know we had corporal punishment that we were caned and uh, mm. uh, and there wasn't any, there was uh, there was rote learning you know so I I just I hated school so I, I was, too. that's crazy yeah so I was very glad to find a job so I worked as a, which for me, this was a, you know, pretty good job because usually you would sort of, uh, sort of non-white people would work in factories or, or in uh, domestic service. So I got a job as a microfilm operator. I, you know, scanned in the documents all day long into this um, micro, microfilm from camera so that was interesting you know I didn't was something new to learn so I did that I worked there for uh, a year and then I felt that I needed to move on uh, at high school I must say what stood me in uh, good stead was taking basic bookkeeping and typing so that at least opened the door for me for a job higher than a factory worker. After a year, I felt that I needed to move on and I wanted something different and I wanted to use more, my typing skills and my bookkeeping skills more. So I got a job at Linen Manufacturers and this is where I met my future husband. So the Lord answered this prayer in this sort of really bizarre way because now, okay, so you must know that uh, everything's, the workplace is uh, still segregated, although, you know, there's a, there's a hierarchy that uh, you had to adhere to. So the bosses were white and then the workers, you see, were non-white. So I were so then the, as I said, the Lord answered this prayer in that I fell in love with a boss's son who was white. 
no, no. This was a big no-no in South Africa. And it was illegal. Well, but the, the way that this happened was that I didn't, it wasn't love at first sight. And uh, when I started there, uh, he he had he had been away, and then I only met him, kind of three weeks into my time, a, at the office. And then uh, when he when he came, I was introduced to him, and then my fellow office uh, worker, the receptionist, said, "I said, oh, who's that?" And she said, "Oh, he's Michael Graham. He's the boss's." boss's son so I said oh all right and uh, you know I just sort of continued on with my work so it wasn't love at first sight or anything like that but it was I think that was in May or June when I started there yes because that's winter time in South Africa in the southern hemisphere uh, so it was kind of a couple of months, three months into after I'd been there, I came down with this really terrible cold. Meanwhile, Michael was working in an adjacent office, and I was working with the two other girls in in the office next to his office. Not his office, really, his father's office and his father's personal assistant secretary. Part of my duties included doing the daily banking because now I was doing a little bit of accountancy in the bookkeeping in the debtors you know looking after the customer accounts and so I had to do banking every day and sometimes Miss Moore who was the she was a sort of a, the senior office manager she oversaw all of us she couldn't always come with me. And then one day she said, uh, she was so, she said, I, I'm too busy right now. Michael, why don't you go with Jennifer to the bank? So he'd accompany me to the bank from time to time. And, you know, we'd make, make small talk and, you know, no sparks flying or anything like that. But uh, that one, then one day I came down with this really stinking cold flu and I was just feeling awful. And I, asked my boss, could I go home? Um, and so as I was exiting in the passage, I bumped into Michael and he said, oh, you're leaving? I said, yeah, oh, yeah I feel awful. I'm really feeling rotten. And he, just by nature, uh, Tim is the kindest person, kindest, caring person. And through his kindness, he said, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, you know. Well, you go home and take care of yourself and dose yourself and, you know, take whatever, take the tight, what equivalent of tight and all, whatever. And, uh, and I hope you feel better. So I was just so touched by this. I thought, wow. I mean, I sort of grew up in a very rough and tumble kind of dog eat dog world and sort of, um, or survival of the fittest, you know, you you head inside and scratch and claw to survive. So there was no kindness or caring oh. or kindness. It was always <laughs> like you were stomped upon or put down if you didn't have your wits about you. So, you know, it was that sort of environment that I grew up in. Everybody and so for here, themselves. Yeah, yeah. Everybody look up for themselves. And so... I was just so touched by his uh, care. And so I went home and it happened to be the weekend coming up. And over the weekend, I couldn't stop thinking about this guy and, you know, being so caring. And, uh, and then I told my girlfriend about him. And I was yes, on a Monday and I, I was still I sort of had butterflies and so forth. And so I told my girlfriend about it. Uh, about this guy and she said does he know I said I have this, this immense crush on him so she said does he know I said no so she said phone him phone him so I said oh I don't know his number so we looked it up in the phone book and then oh this was you know like for a couple a week or so a couple of weeks later <laughs> so then I called him and I said that I was a secret admirer <laughs> 
<laughs> and nice. he, he he was kind of taken aback, and he said, uh, "I didn't, I didn't uh, disclose disclose who I was." So he's he was kind of taken aback, and he said, "Oh yes," and because uh, I thought, you know, he was going to tell me, you know, get get lost, that I'm I'm a prankster, and you know, get lost. So then he said, "Um." Uh, yes, he wanted to know a little bit more. And then I said to my friend, what do I say now? What do I say now? Anyway, and I was in a phone in a phone booth because we we, we didn't have a phone at our place. And we uh, we went on the phone long and he said, can, can we meet? So, ooh, my heart, you know, going boom, 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 boom. And I said, sure. <laughs> But he doesn't know who I am because I also put on this very posh voice, you see. <laughs> so, so uh, anyway, I said, sure. And then we arranged uh, a place to meet. And then when I met him, I said, did, did you know it was I? And he said, oh, well, no, I don't know. I I don't know. Uh, I Maybe I had a I had a hunch. I don't know. Anyway, so I, I, that's all in my book, all the, hmm. the details, all the little juicy details in my book. Yeah. And, yeah. So if we want more, we got to buy the book. <laughs> yes, yes. So a clandestine relationship ensued between the two of us, and we skulked around and met in secret, and it was a very dangerous game that we were playing under the apartheid system. There were uh, just lots of uh, things that that happened. As I said, you know, I wrote about that in my book. Could you have we gone left... to prison for that, by the way? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes, wow. we were just lucky that we weren't caught. And and this, we had had this clandestine relationship for about over a year, a year and a half or so. Yeah. Wow. So then we left South Africa in 1975 to, for England. And then when I was 19, we got married. Can I ask, was the departure to England to be able to continue without having to worry about being caught? Yes. Mm. Yes, that, 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 was the, that was the thing. Yeah, we, we had to leave. We couldn't carry on. And it became dangerous for us because, you know, we could go to prison. Mm. So in England, <clears throat> after we got married, uh, it was important for me to to belong to a church that was very important to uh, not forsake meeting with fellow believers so we were now because Michael came from an Anglican background and I came from a Pentecostal background we thought well you know uh, the Baptist church would be a good middle ground so we uh, when we got married in the Baptist Church in in Leeds, England, uh, Michael was doing post grad work at the Leeds University at that time. So that we that's where we got married, and the minister's wife, the, the people were just so uh, welcoming and accepting of us because it was a university town, and so they did have uh, outreach ministry to students, and. They they really embraced us, and when they heard our story, they embraced us. And the minister's wife took me under her wing and became a surrogate mother to me, and organized the wedding and everything. So for me, this was God's answer to prayer. This was providence because I had mm. prayed, I had prayed and and said, you know, during our this tumultuous relationship and courtship I had prayed God you know if it's your will whatever your will I'm I will accept it if it's your will for Michael and me not to be together I know you have a different plan and purpose for me but if it if it is your will please open the way for us and so I saw all this falling into place as God's providence and then I knew that God had supplied my need according to his riches in glory and I, because I put my faith and trust in him. And so it was all working out really nicely. So I wanted to to come back to your previous question about, about starting a family. 
I really wanted to us to start our own uh, family and run my family as I desired life as it should be. My daughter a quick was, question real quick yeah. for, just for context, historical context. Sure. If you had gotten married and then returned to South Africa as, as a married couple, was that we, considered acceptable? No, no, there, there was no looking back, Tim. We couldn't go back. So, marriage, but I mean, let's just say theoretically someone did say someone went to England, you know, separately, you meet there, uh, you get married, you move, you come yeah. back even to visit. Would yeah. they, would they lock you up just for, for that? Yes. It, because you would be breaking the apartheid laws, uh, because mm. unless you stayed separately, unless you went back as a married couple and then I stayed with my family and he stayed with his family and we didn't see each other but we couldn't go back as a married couple no mm. okay thank you that's yeah that's, that's so, very hard to hear wow. yeah i know there's some lots of horror stories like that so my daughter was born in 1977 and our son was born in 1980 and so we settled down in happy domesticity in england michael was building his career and my, of course my job was to honor the lord by uh, raising my children by caring for my children and running a good house. And we went to church on Sundays to the Baptist church and uh, just led a sort of very docile life. Uh, in 1981, my husband's job took us to Canada, another new adventure. Again, we sought out an evangelical Baptist church where we could slot into the church family life, God's family, the family of God. By this time, I was 26 years old. And about this time, my bouts of depression became worse and worse. Mm. When, when, when things went well for me, I ascribed it to the goodness of God. But when things didn't go well for me, I turned on myself for being so wicked and being so disobedient uh, to God. Uh, because a pastor actually told me at that time that depression was a sin because I was, foc I was focusing too much on myself and not enough on God. So I tried so hard, Tim. I tried so hard to please God, to be a good Christian, to be obedient, to do the whole ball of wax. And I kept surrendering and I kept hearing about you got, got to surrender my will to God uh, and purpose to read my Bible more and pray more. And I knew my Bible very well uh, because I had uh, been to Bible studies and by this time, well, I had led Bible studies and uh, I belonged to home groups. I was uh, memorizing scripture through the Navigators 2-7 course. Uh, and I, I, had, I always had an inquiry in mind and a, a thirst for learning. And of course, the answers were to be found only in God's word. It's interesting yeah. what you said about how the idea of depression is an example of you're not being focused on the Lord enough or the right way or whatever, mm, too mm. self-centered. That was so prevalent in so many groups for from what I can tell for so long of just you, I know. like the, the thing you need is it, they'd almost phrase it. And I, I've heard many people say this, it's like, you don't need a counselor. You need a preacher. You don't need yeah. to have therapy. You need to memorize more scripture because what you need to do is simply understand that you had the biggest weight of the world, as it were, on your shoulders, the weight of sin mm -hmm. and the punishment you deserved, and mm -hmm. Christ lifted it. So there, every, mm -hmm. everything else in life, it, comparatively, like, oh, we're having financial troubles, oh, we're having health troubles, we're having marriage troubles, that those might be issues, but they're so tiny compared to the sin and hell issue that it's like, mm -hmm. it's like comparing a little grain of rice to a monster truck. It's like, they're com completely different issues in terms of the enormity of what was at stake. And like, you may have these issues of, of your life, but it's like a grain of rice compared to what God saved you from. 
And if you could just realize, and it is, he didn't just save you, but he gave you power. Like you mentioned earlier, the Holy spirit and the contrast Mm. was like so Mm. big that if you would just Mm. dwell on what he's done for you, Mm. that the, what you need most is Mm. simply a better vision for the death and resurrection of Christ. And Mm. if you could do that, every, every concern, every depression, anything that just, that just feels like a weight will suddenly Mm -hmm. feel like it's a light, light as a feather because you realize you have been redeemed from the, the, the worst parts of, of, of your experience. And that at this point, nothing else is really that big a deal. And, and, and of course, in the bigger picture, the knowledge that whether in this life or in glory, in the afterlife, God's going to fix it all anyway. So like, what are of you worried course. about? It's like, it's like telling mm-hmm. it's like when you have a kid who's, who's dying of, of the hunger, not literally mm-hmm. like they're just, they're saying like, Oh, I'm so hungry, but you know, you're mm-hmm. about to serve dinner in like two minutes. Like, but I'm so hungry. Like, yeah, but you're, mm-hmm. <laughs> can you not mm-hmm. smell the bacon's cooking? Yeah. You know, everything's ready. You're going to, you're, yeah. I'm literally going to call you to the table and serve yeah. you a nice meal in two minutes. Like, but I'm hungry now. Like it's two minutes away. Just hold on. But they act like it's such a big deal. And it was like the pressures of, and the anxiety of life was like that. But it's like, God's about to do something in, in at the end of your life to transform you into so much glory and peace and beauty. It's like, stop fussing. It's it's all good. He's got it. And you're about to absolutely explode with joy. So yeah. taste, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. And, and it, yeah. this, all these things will just fade away. I, I, I definitely hear you on this. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. very real, very real. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you couldn't pull it off, <laughs> something wrong with you. Exactly. Yeah. God. Yeah. No, God hasn't. So if you say, you know, I don't feel God. I don't feel God's love. God feels so distant. Uh, no, no, God's always there. Who moved? God didn't move. You moved. Uh, so it was always on you. You're not good enough. You're not praising God enough. You're not giving God enough glory and wh- whatever. And so, as I say, you know, I was reading uh, Christian books and I was oh listening to the Christian radio at that time. So I lived in North America, and so there's lots of good Christian radio in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And so, but the books that I read, as I said, you know, I had a thirst for learning, but the books were, yeah, I limited myself to the 66 books of disjointed, barbaric Iron Age literature. And the books that I read were uh, books from the church library, like Hal Lindsey, uh, Frank Peretti. Uh, oh, nice. I listened to yeah, <laughs> I listened to Christian radio and then the Bible exposition, like Chuck Swindoll, Chuck Smith, John MacArthur. I mean, I'm not 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 a big fan of him. And uh, we had a lot Vernon, of similar similar experiences or similar uh, influences. Yeah, and, and Vernon McGee, Vernon McGee uh, from Texas, uh, and uh, he amused me. He had, I loved his Texas draw, and he had some quaint uh, sayings like uh, he, when he, he chastising moms, stay at home moms, for watching too much uh, daytime soap operas, and then he would say, The oven is cold, but the TV is hot. <laughs> oh my so, goodness. It was his it was his program the old time gospel hour? Was that yeah, 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 yeah. And then and, and of course all of this, though I was influenced by pre-mega church, you know, pre-mega church, Rick Warren and Joe Osteen. So I was influenced by the old school, old school guys. So I felt that I was really growing in the Lord, and you know, I really admired Chuck Swindoll's exposition of, of the world. Uh, I I was beginning to question because, you know, now I was having this depression and I, uh, Philip Yancey's book, Disappointment with God, actually was a very honest book and it really got me thinking. So in the early 1990s, we moved to the United States through Michael's job. And this was, again, job-related. And by this time, my children were teenagers. And uh, it was a a difficult move because we took them to the the deep south because it was Mobile, Alabama that we moved to. So uh, so my children, um, 
I cringe to admit this, but I had raised them on James Dobson. Cringe. And, but but thankfully they they came through unscathed. <laughs> so at this time, I, my children were teenagers. They were, as uh, my daughter was in high school and my son was uh, in the, what was he, fifth grade, or fourth grade. Uh, so at this time, I had a lot of time on my hands. So I prayed and asked God's guidance as to what, he wants me to do next. So from the mid eighties onward, I did feel pressured by f the feminists uh, whose message just was very loud and vocal. And I became aware of the likes of Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem's names. But of course, these, these are women uh, were not godly women, you know, I, how can I possibly possibly listen to their messages because it went totally against uh, the what the Bible t taught. So this was the time when cognitive dissonance set in. I wrestled and struggled with my worth as a as a woman, but I was taught that my worth was in God alone. It never occurred to me that I could become, that I could pursue a career in, in anything that I wanted because, you know, I was told that this would displease God. So the more I studied the Bible, the more questions I had and the more cognitive dissonance set in. And there'd be times that in mid-prayer, I would, I would, my, my brain would say, who, who are you praying to? Where is this pray, prayer going? Who's on the other side? Who's, is there somebody on the other side listening? Have you had that, Tim? Did that happen to you? At the very end, yeah, not until I was, I was all the way in it until the very end of which yeah. point I was all the way out. But yeah, I've, that was yeah. my last, last step. Yeah. And then, you know, my having, an inquiring mind in mid prayer, I'd be thinking, how does this prayer thing actually work? You know, is there actually some? Is there somebody? Is it? Is it a God? What? If, what if nobody's listening to my prayer? What if my prayer is going into the ether? So you know, these were all thoughts that started to niggle. Mm. But can I just add for yeah. for my side? Mine wasn't mm. as much the question of is he is he hearing us for the longest time. I you know that was settled in my mind until the very end. My question was what is the use of trying to listen for his will? What I mean by that is there were times when I was sure that I was sure that I was sure that I was sure that I heard his will that I saw the path that he opened up the doors and I'd asked him to you know make it clear and he made it clear in my mind as to what he wanted and then the door say a month later, or six months later, something happened to absolutely slam it shut in a brutal way to the point. I was like, what, what just happened? Did, did you open the door or didn't you? My question was not, was he listening to me? My question was, why does it feel like I'm being toyed with? And that was my, mm -hmm. so it was similar, but, but a little different. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then of course we <laughs> When the door was slammed, then you'd be told, oh, well, you know, God closes one door and he opens up another. Exactly. <laughs> All these cliches and <laughs> fridge memes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but my uh, in then my indoctrinated brain would kick in, you know, and I had these questions. Uh, oh, where's that voice coming from? And... <laughs> And this reminds me about the church lady in Saturday Night Live, you know, you know that that skit. Yeah. When they, when Dana Carvey says, "Is it Satan?" <laughs> so, exactly. So yeah, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. like you know, no matter what it is, you you always have a reason to second guess yourself and 
Yeah, yeah. You, you're never really like you, you always feel like the carpet's going to get pulled out from under you either because you're going to have a, a blatant sin, a secret sin. The devil's going to get you. You're going to misinterpret yeah. scripture. You're yeah. going to get some influence. Yeah, it's like and it's 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 whatever it is when it happens, it's, and it's bound to happen because you're not yeah. you're not perfect yet like God. When it happens, yeah. it's somehow your fault. Exactly, exactly. So yes, yeah, so uh, anyway, I rebuked the devil and carried on with my prayer. <laughs> But by this time, I had belonged to uh, an organization down in the South. Well, I mean, they're international uh, now, but uh, Mobile had a Christian women's club. So I belonged to that organization. And uh, it's affiliated with Stonecraft's uh, ministry, a non-denominational, non-profit Christian organization. And it was founded by a lady called uh, Helen Duff. Bow, wow, in 1938, headquartered in Kansas City. And it had regional offices that uh, had, you know, it was pretty, very well organized, headed by field directors uh, throughout the US. And in uh, the statistic of 2009, says that they had over 40,000 volunteers that served in 64 countries as missionaries. So the ministry provides, also the ministry provides internships and mentorships and training at the local and the regional and international levels. And I felt like this was an answer from God, that God brought, the, connected me with this organization and that I, this is where I could, this was the next chapter in my life to serve God. So I became a, a CWC speaker, uh, being guest speaker at regional clubs. So clubs would typically meet monthly and we would meet for a catered lunch in a non-church environment. It was important that we meet in a non-church environment so people could feel comfortable, so that you could uh, give your testimony. I mean, bring the bring the gospel, but it was more for the speaker. It was giving your testimony, saying what your life was before you met Jesus and how your life changed after you met Jesus. And so we would meet maybe at a nice hotel, at a, at a nice resort, and there were clubs, as I said, all over. So when I was not attending my local club. I was traveling to clubs all over, all across the southern states, all across Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, Tennessee. And then I was billeted by by many interesting people, stayed with many interesting people. And uh, it was great. It was great to get out. I was meeting people and the people person. There was promise in this organization. At the meetings, we would it would be sort of non-churchy. We would have maybe um, special themes, like a, a Easter theme, Valentine's Day theme, Christian theme, and the tables would be all decorated, all nice, nicey nice. We had nice food and special music. Somebody would do special music, and then there would be an art and craft demonstration, and then now it's time for the speaker. And then that's when I would go up, and then I would, uh, say, oh, give my story, you know, like I'm doing now, sort of in a conversational way. And then I'm guessing your was... story had a different ending than this one's going to have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, oh, definitely. So there were there were uh, room at the end, and then I had to make a sort of invitation to uh, to, to the ladies if anyone. Uh, wanted to receive Jesus, or if they had a prayer request, please fill out the cards on the table uh, if you wanted to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, or if you have a prayer request, fill that out, and then uh, that would be collected at the end of the meeting. Everybody would go home except for me and the club president, and then we would pray over these, uh, uh, these cards. Uh, and then, oh, look, this one accepted Jesus and that one accepted Jesus. So, yay, God used me. I I brought these people to Christ. So 
Yeah, so so I was very involved then when I lived in uh, Mobile uh, uh, in the Christian Muse uh, uh, Women's uh, to being on the committee. And uh, so that, you know, gave me a sense of purpose and a sense of serving God and feeling that I was in God's will on the right way. But a few years into that, I... I th- well, and then I I thought that I felt fulfilled, and that I was on the right track, but then uh, a few years later I sort of lost my enthusiasm, my motivation, my enthusiasm, my enthusiasm. I was very lonely uh, down south. Yeah, you know, I had these friends, but uh, I had these friends and fellow Christians in ministry, but. I still there still was escaping loneliness, and I still had bouts of depression. Uh, the depression never went away. Yeah, yeah, I found that people were were friendly, but it was sort of on a very superficial basis. And so, the older I got, the worse the depression got. And then at this point, I was finally put on medication. I saw counselors, but they had to be Christian counselors, of course. And then one counselor sent me to uh, see a psychiatrist for the for, to be put on medication. So at this point, I was put on medication that uh, that that helped uh, balance the depression or keep me from going off the deep end because the depression became more and more severe. Hmm. Oh, did you Kness, so, did you feel like it was sinful to be taking medicine, or that it was at least a, a sign of a lack of faith in any way? No, no, because you know I did. I, I did trust in, um, yeah, in science. You know, I was taking medicine, or other stuff. If you took medicine for diabetes or for or for something else, for anything else, how could it be a sin? So, and yeah. also, God gave these people the wisdom <laughs> to make the medicine. <laughs> exactly. So, I just ask because I know a lot of people would have said yeah. that that was in, an indication that you weren't waiting on God to to heal you or. Use trying to use yeah. the uh the pagan methods and uh, yeah. especially that the idea that it, it's it's truly literally changing your mind the chemicals are truly changing your brain mm, and it's like no, that's no. that's the holy spirit's job you know so I, yeah. there was a lot of influences in my life that said don't yeah. do that unless it's like one of those yeah. really weird like uh schizophrenia kind of things where like there's just mm. there's no other path but medicine but otherwise you know traditional depression if you could call it that you need to just trust God. So anyway, I was just curious how you saw that. Well, yeah, no, 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 uh, no. I, I, the meds, the meds were good. It balanced me out. So from that point onward, I think I began. Then after that, shortly after that, then we, we moved. Actually, we moved to New Zealand at this point because Michael had retired. He took early retire. He was early retirement. He was fifty five at that time, so he took early retirement, and then. From that point, I began to question more and more the validity of the Bible and Christian beliefs and teaching and so forth. In in New Zealand, we, uh, well, at the time I felt God led us to this church. It was an Anglican church. It was a, so, so we went from being Southern Baptist now to Anglican. So the and I liked what I liked about the Anglican Church is that I like the liturgy, I like the order, uh, I like the tradition. It was something very different that appealed to me, and it was calmer. It, it was it was calmer, and they the Anglicans had a little bit more freedom to to dance and to and to drink wine and. Some of them even smoked. <laughs> so, uh, so I I like that aspect of it. Uh, so I sort of got away from the hardcore fundamentalism. Although that Anglican Church was still was a evangelical Anglican Church, so they still had the fundamental, but I would say soft core as opposed to hardcore fundamentalism. So. That gave me more freedom to think and to 
explore uh, the Bible, or, or it's a Bible or Christian living, but because it was an evangelical Anglican church, there was still the fact that you were a miserable sinner, and uh, they, of course, had the Eucharist every Sunday, whereas in the Baptist church, I don't think so much. You didn't have the communion every Sunday, which for me got more and more depressing, Tim. The more I co- went to communion, the more depressed I got because you got uh, now we uh, in the Anglican church, you have the liturgy. And so in the liturgy, you had the confession, everybody said, collectively said the confession before the communion. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow man in word and in thought and in deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent for our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. So this, uh, uh, you know, we are miserable sinners. Uh, Oh, you know, that just, it, it just depressed me. So I just felt that I could not, you, you, you can't get ahead. It, you know, no matter how hard you try. And another another uh, passage in the liturgy was, we do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. So, you know, that kind of worm theology, Tim, uh, it, I found it so depressing. And then oh, yes. when we returned to Canada in 2010, uh, we had been away for, from Canada, roaming the globe for uh, 20 years. We came back. And so it was important that we, Again, okay. well, not that important, but I think we just sort of automatically gravitated back toward the church community. And, you know, we didn't, we were away for 20 years. We had to kind of start all over again, forming community. And the logical choice for us was to find community in the church. So this time we went to an Anglican church. We sort of left the Baptist behind. We went to the Anglican church again. And I, I was getting more and more disgruntled with church attendance because, again, you know, with this communion thing, it, it just was such a downer. So uh, Easter 2015 was the last time I set in, a foot in church after the pastor intoned pre-communion, how undeserving, how sinful, how disobedient we all were. And that's when I said, you know, Enough, enough of this. I'm not buying into this crap anymore. So I made my Truman exit. Uh, I'll come back to my this point, my Truman ex- exit. So at communion, uh, you were beating yourself up Sunday after Sunday. You go for spirit, a spiritual flogging session. It, it, it's it was. To me, I think it was so masochistic and, and that that was so depressing. And the sermon was always how short you fall. It was like battered wives syndrome, Tim, that believing that I was to blame and feeling powerless and unable to fight back. And at this point, I had uh, yeah, come across Christopher Hitchens' uh, paraphrasing of a quote by Falk Gravel, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he says, once you assume a creator and a plan, it makes us objects in a cruel experiment whereby we are created, sick, and commanded to be well. Because it, it's, it is demanded of you to do the impossible. You'll always be guilty. You'll always fall short. 
you'll always sin, you'll always confess, and will always be in the claws of the priest. And so that is how I felt. For me, enough was enough. And then Easter sun, uh, Sunday, uh, 2015, was the last time I said foot, uh, foot in church. And I had so many questions about God and my relationship. And the stuff answers from the, the pastors uh, would be regurgitating stuff from the Bible. God is sovereign. God loves you. Just trust. Just have faith. But, you know, that didn't do it for me anymore. At this point, I had, um, I was reading a lot. I was reading a lot of literature outside of uh, Christian literature mm. and exploring other ideas. Also, uh, I had I had gone back to school uh, to uh, pursue my degree, and although it was a um, a a BAP, it used to be a Baptist college, the University of Mobile, but uh, it was a liberal arts university. So it I was exposed now to other ideas, to other literature, to philosophy, uh, to science um mm -hmm. so yeah so i had it sort of it and this sort of opened my mind uh, little by little over, over time and then you know i took to heart the saying of jesus seek and you will find it and i mean i really really thought with all my heart with an open mind and uh, in all honesty uh, but then the answer came as a surprise around this time i've been watching the movie, The Truman Show. You familiar with that, with Jim Carrey? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so it became clear to me that the, 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 the Bible and the Christian life, my Christian life, was akin to that fake TV set in in which uh, the TV set that controlled my life. Uh, yeah. like, like the character uh, yeah, Jim Carrey. Truman. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think that the Truman Show is an absolutely great picture of it because, yeah, you do end up completely controlled. And when you realize the, the amount of control that you're under and that it's all being orchestrated, as it were, and that you're not really yourself, you've never really lived to your own self for, for a day in your life. As soon no. as your eyes open, it's like, oh, I've, I've got to get out of this. The aha moment for me was that the scene toward the end of the movie where Truman is in his in the in the sailboat and the the mast uh, or the, the thing in the front here uh he comes to the horizon because of the everything is sort of artificial it's a fake lake and everything and the sky is uh, artificial too and when the thing pierces through through the uh, this uh canvas uh wall then he realizes oh, oh my gosh that was the aha, uh, and for me, I could so I could so relate because it so mirrored my life, and the answer came like that to to me that I was I, I walked out for me it was like walking out of this Iron Age teaching that I had been indoctrinated in, uh, and then of course Truman goes up the stairs and he goes out the door. And the producer says to him, Truman, turn back, turn back. The, the, it's a horrible world out there. It's terrible, you know. It's, it's a, and and then when he got into the into the big wide world, it wasn't this horrible, sinful, horrible place. Uh, there was this new world out there to explore in 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 a in a different, wondrous way, you know, through through fresh eyes. Yeah, and, it's a great, it's a great movie for that picture. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So I had uh, to free my mind, yes, uh, from the tyranny of enslavement of this archaic paternalistic world and this God that had a plan for all humankind and assigning us to that which is unattainable. Uh, and and that, that was my aha moment. And then after that, I started uh, getting reading books that 
really helped me in my healing process, like uh, Lissa Rankin's book, The Fear Cure. Have you heard of that no. book? Mm-hmm. The Fear Cure. She, I think she's a psychologist. Um, and it was, to me, living the Christian life was so stressful and so fear-based uh, that uh, it was mentally unhealthy for me. I realized just how mentally unhealthy it was. And and she helped me to dispel the limiting beliefs that I had of myself and also connected me to my wonderful self and my uh, that I was worthy of love and that I and I could embrace my who I was in my creative self, you know, being creative and and worthy in my own right and being good in my own right, that I didn't need uh, Jesus to make me good. Mm. So, yeah, so that was very freeing. And then, of course, uh, there was Marlene Winnell's Leaving the Fold. That uh, And then I realized that I was not alone, that there was an army of wounded people and scarred people by people scarred by religious trauma and indoctrination. Can I ask real quick before you uh, jo- jump yeah. on, was your husband able to have these conversations with you? Like ha- when did that, yeah. when did you cross the bridge of your doubts? Yeah, I, I think we kind of, we, we had these thoughts together. We were both disillusioned with, with church and organized religion and sort of just going through the motion and and the uh, the pet answers that we were given. Uh, so we both went through that quest and questioning and we had lots of discussions uh, back and forth. Uh, so awesome. yeah, we both, we, I think he's kind of more of an agnostic uh, than an atheist. Uh, for me, I just I came to the conclusion that I I do not believe that there is sufficient evidence of the existence of God, right. and that yeah, and that uh, that faith is is not a virtue. Faith is when you don't have uh, the answers and you don't have the evidence for. A God, and so you know that's the conclusion that I re- reached after I read, you know, uh, other uh, uh, Marlene Winnell, Valerie Dorico. I saw you had her on, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Bart Ehrman, Dan Barker, and the list, uh, the long list of those people. Uh, Dr. Francesca Strava Kupalu. I don't know I'm butchering her name. Uh, she's a uh, biblical scholar um, and and just giving you the historical, the real historical angle, uh, you know, other than just getting all your information from these, from 66 books to the exclusion of, of all the other literature out there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That's and so awesome. also, That's awesome. Yeah, and then then what other what uh, the other thing that just helped me aided me in my healing was uh, John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness uh, mindfulness for for beginners and mindfulness meditation. Not that I replaced that with religion, but it was just a different way of being, and and it is very very much a way of being. Uh, so that helped me a lot in my healing and I'm really I've opened myself up and I continue to to all knowledge in the the history of religion the history of Christianity and other religions science cosmology psychology and I just read widely and took copious notes and you know I'm still on that learning path but Mm. I'm enjoying the freedom. My like my mind just feels so free, and the depression has really lessened. The depression and the anxiety, depression and anxiety go together. Uh, 
The anxiety is the uh, the fear the the fear of uh, threat of future threat, like the what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. And the Bible very much is very anxiety inducing. Oh, you know, if I don't do this, this will happen. This will happen. I'll go to hell. You know, do yeah. Very anxiety inducing. So none of that. And I don't feel, I feel that I can just finally relax and just be me and enjoy being me. And, mm. and still, Amazing. still do, still do good, still do good uh, to other, for others, but not doing good out of duty, out of good because to please God or to sp- score brownie points with God. But it's just to be a good human being. So I think I would, uh, yeah. So, and you know, Tim, nobody came and proselytized to me. Nobody said, it's not like, you know, uh, somebody for an atheist came and said, oh, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to get you out of, get you out of Christianity. It was a long process, a 20 year journey and it was sort of I like this analogy of you know when you're tossed about in the ocean in the deep ocean in the waves and then you are pushed uh and this turmoil and and then you're pushed out by the waves and you pushed more and you pushed more and you pushed more and finally you land on the beach you you home free you can get up and you can walk away into the sunset and that's my story. <laughs> mm. I love it. Amazing stuff. That is yeah. that is just classic, and it's so beautiful. And I, I love too how you 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 wove in how you just were learning and kept learning so much. And I think that's mm. one of the biggest things that I would second in my story is it, like once mm. you realize that you were kept sort of kept from a lot of information, and that you were also put in this mindset that that other information doesn't even matter. Like the, the whole poisoning the well issue where it's like yes. that, that information. Yeah. There's there's stuff you could learn. Sure. But mm. who, who needs it? You've got the word of mm. God and you, you've, you've got, you get people to the point where they don't even care to learn more. And when you realize yeah. that not only is there so much more information that you were deprived of, but that mm-hmm. it really, really matters. It really changes perspectives and that mm-hmm. you need that and you need it now. Mm. And that once you have it, it will recolor everything you've seen about the world. It's amazing it, the way that it works. It, it really, like you said, it wakes you up. And it actually makes you whole. It really makes you whole. Yeah. Um, and I, I must um, also just uh, back back up a, a bit and say that, you know, the journey hasn't been smooth as I'm recounting it. I, I went through periods of anger and periods of resentment, resentment that my... Uh, that my choice was taken away, uh, that I that I could not uh, that I could not uh, uh, achieve the best of who I could have been with my talents and and so forth, uh, and, and that and anger and so forth. But you know, I, I had to go through that and uh, go through that period of of healing and mourning and uh and and as i say being washed out on the beach and uh, get up and being whole and just enjoying the now living in the now yeah i love it mm-hmm. i was just mm-hmm. going to ask um could i i sometimes like to ask could you dive a little bit deeper into like contrasting and comparing this sense of peace that you had uh just that the worldview piece of like we used to say as Christians, it is well with my soul. Yeah. Like what, what would you say was the, the profound peace level? Like, can, you know, in the two different mindsets? I think the, the one was, um, when you, when you had that sense of peace, it was, I, I think it, it depended on how, on what kind of emotional experience that you that you had because uh, you know there were times that you felt a sort of transcendence and you felt that you were in the presence of god and you thought oh wow uh it it is it is well, well with my soul but that was all uh, it was an emotional experience but 
deep down, it didn't, you know, the next day the depression would go come back. Why did that peace not sustain you? Uh, and why did you have to keep going through the same the, the same emotions and the and it was the struggling and the same struggle, Tim, trying to please God. And you could never, it was this was sort of like a parent that you could never please. You, you could never ever be good enough until then until you are uh, glorified. And uh, I couldn't live with that. Uh, mm. I, now, to contrast that, I feel that I am, as I said, I feel that I have, I've been made whole and I can really participate in life, the everyday of life. I can participate in, in nature, in the enjoyment of family of relationships and just be uh, without any ul ulterior motives just yeah. just be just be peaceful be peaceful with my grandchildren be peaceful with my friends uh be peaceful with myself being at peace with myself that's the main thing yeah and i think too just when you realize that most likely we are mortal and and they have no immortality whatsoever and that life is finite and very short that it therefore becomes mm -hmm. exponentially more precious and mm -hmm. therefore you just you feel more alive because you're like every breath every minute counts because i truly like this is it this is what i've got and it, it definitely wakes you up a little bit and it like you said it, there's a grieving process there's an anger process but once you get past some of the worst parts of that you just you start to get grounded and you're like all right, you know, it, it happened. It is what it is. I came mm -hmm. from where I came from, but I'm mm -hmm. where I'm at now. My mind is free and yeah. wow, the world looks so different, so beautiful in some ways. And mm -hmm. my life certainly is, is more like, I, I feel more empowered than ever. My autonomy is back in, at least in part. And it's a great starting point. It's a launching pad for, for the new you. And it's like, like the joke, you know, you're born again, again, and it's, it's a <laughs> wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. So, yeah. But I know I've asked yeah. you a lot, but, um, I did want to uh, bring us to a conclusion, but did you have any final thoughts or anything else that we didn't get to that you wanted to add today? I would like to end with this quote, which I love from Carl Sagan, who says, it is better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. Hmm. That's the, yeah. It's a great, great word, Dan. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Mm. Well, I would love to have you back someday. I, I feel like I've got a lot of questions I didn't get to, but um, this is a great starting point. Um, mm -hmm. but, but thank you so much. I really, you're 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 an inspiration. I love your story. I love how you. It almost feels like you you had to battle to just to, just to get back to you know the square one, as it were. You battled, but you did it. You did it. Uh, you know, sort of behind the scenes in your heart and your mind, and eventually you did it very intentionally. But you battled and you took your life back, and that's just. That's what in many ways these are all about is, is figuring out that you, you are, you're worth more, your life is worth more and that you deserve better than what you were given. And especially just my, the fact that you deserve the truth as opposed to lies. Oh, God. I took, I took my power back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what a beautiful thing and a beautiful thing as well to, to be able to start helping other people do the same thing. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate your story today. Well, um, I'll just wrap up by saying we've been speaking with Jennifer Graham. Jennifer, uh, so great to get to know you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Tim. Enjoyed yes. it. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great okay. day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.